Ah, Bond Girls. Some of the most popular, prominent, and perhaps misrepresented of all staple 007 film elements. You'll know the oft-mentioned stereotype, the one of the damsel in distress who James Bond needs to rush in to save in the film's final act. A character who might look mighty swell in a lovely little nothing, but couldn't tell you how many O's are in 007. Even the actresses themselves seem to be under some illusion that each of them were somehow playing something very different to that stereotype in each of their respective films. When you did um, this part for Sigalore, there were no parts that had ever been written like that. It was the most avant-garde, modern part for its time. So when I got there and read the script and realized that, that this character was going to be strong, and she, it was going to be the first time that, that a woman could do what Bond could do. My character is definitely not the traditional Bond girl. I think Bond girls always have been strong. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's a trend, kind of. I think that question is always a little bit pathetic from journalists. Are you going to be stronger in this film? Because I heard that every Bond girl before every movie is saying the same thing, that my character is going to be much stronger this time. Of course we are strong. Bond women have always been strong, I think. Wow, okay, uh, props to you, Isabella, for breaking that narrative chain, but yes, while there might be certain female characters in James Bond that fit the stereotype, and the marketing for the films probably plays into this wider perception too, but when it comes to the main Bond girls of the series, I dare say that there are a damn sight more that qualify as tough, intelligent, savvy, knowing, and emotionally rounded than your pigeonholed damsels. Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. Welcome to a video celebrating these pivotal characters. This is a ranking of every main Bond Bond girl. But before we get into the list, just a few bits of housekeeping business up front. For the most part, designating main Bond girls is easy. Generally, they're the female co-stars, and oftentimes Bond ends the film with them about to engage in some fornication. Surprisingly, a lot of the time on rafts or boats. I don't know what it is about Bond, sex, and water, but I guess don't go opening a bottle of Evian around the guy. It's like Viagra to him. There have, of course, been a couple of instances where the main Bond girl has not made it to the finale sex raft due to, well, death, but I think it's clear that both Tracy and Vespa still qualify as main Bond women of their respective films. The distinction becomes slightly more muddled in the Craig films, though. Bond doesn't have much of a romantic entanglement at all with Camille Montez in Quantum of Solace. I mean, they share a kiss and that's about it, but I think it's still very clear that she meets the criteria of Bond girl status. Madeline Swan is the only Bond woman to take the mantle of main Bond girl in two separate installments, while Skyfall, I'm gonna perhaps controversially say, does not really have have a main Bond girl, or at least not one that it would feel fair including on this list. I mean, yes, Bond sleeps with Severin, but she's in the film so little that she's very much a secondary Bond girl as far as I'm concerned. And I've seen people make the case that Judy Dench's M is kind of the main Bond woman of the film, and I don't necessarily disagree with that, but obviously their relationship is so different and she's in so many films in the series that I don't feel like it would be fair comparing her to the rest of the actresses in this category. As such, I will be ranking 23 Bond girls who I identify as the main Bond girls of the E.ON series. Now, this is by far the hardest of all of the main James Bond film elements for me to rank because, quite honestly, there are no characters on this list that I actively dislike. It feels unfair to put anyone at the bottom of this list. But someone has to come at the bottom, and honestly, when I started putting this list together, I never thought it would be Kissy from You Only Live Twice, but it was really only when thinking about the order of these characters that it kind of dawned on me that everyone else on this list has at least a one standout moment in their respective films for me personally. Whether that be a crucial role in helping Bond achieve his mission, or uh, having a particularly kick-ass moment, or a particularly sexy moment, or a particularly funny moment, I can cite bits in all of their respective films where they make a real impact. All except for Kissy Suzuki. Think again, please. And maybe that's not surprising. I mean, her name isn't even mentioned in the film until the very end credits. And despite being the Bond girl by virtue of making it all the way to the sex dinghy with Bond at the end, Aki is a character in the same film who makes a much greater impression, but is off during the midsection of the film and pretty much just replaced with Kissy for little reason other than just fitting another beautiful woman in the film. And indeed, Mie Hama, who plays Kissy, is stunningly attractive. Please just take it for granted that that applies to all of the women on 
on this list, actually. And she spends a good deal of the film running around in this super skimpy bikini. So perhaps the highlight, yeah, perhaps that's highlight enough for some people. But overall, despite my like of the actress, she absolutely doesn't do anything wrong here. The writing only allows her to make an appearance like way late into the film. And while she provides solid allyship for Bond throughout the climax, I just don't feel like she makes enough of an impression to be competing with any of the other characters on this list, unfortunately. Think again, please. Oh god, I just know I'm gonna get some stick for this, but yes, I know a lot of people really like this character. Kara Malovi from The Living Daylights, she's another Bond woman that I just, I, she just doesn't move the needle for me all that much. I appreciate that she is perhaps one of the most realistically written of Bond's female co-stars in the series. Like, barring a few moments and her obviously exceptional cellist skills, she does play like an ordinary person who has kind of stumbled into Bond's world, into this world of espionage. I think that the actress Mariam Darbo does a really great job portraying that naivety, though it does begin to grate on me, particularly towards the end. Like, she makes some really poor decisions at places. Uh, believable, perhaps, but some of the things that she does border on, like, broadly comedic. Like, she's so hapless at times, it just feels like Bond could well be on a mission with Stan Laurel. Well, here's another nice mess you've got me into. Well, I could talk to the However, there are certain moments in the film where I feel like she really excels. When she and Bond first meet in her apartment, like, it's so rare to have a feeling of domesticity, of realism in Bond. Like, her living is a very meager, very humdrum life, and in comes this man to whisk her away on this fabulous adventure, and I like all of that stuff. I can see why people would love this character and her role in the film, even though she's not a high ranker for me personally. Looks like we're going down together. If any of the actresses on this list were done a dirty by the quality of writing in their respective roles, it's Halle Berry. So I love this actress. I've seen her in tons of stuff. I think she's great, but I don't think anyone on earth could sell lines like this. Wow. Now there's a mouthful. Oh, yeah, I think I got the thrust of it. Your mama. Jacinta Johnson, aka Jinx, is done no favours by starring in uh, probably the most derided Bond film of them all in Dine of the Day, which was initially supposed to serve as a launch pad for a spin-off for this character, with her in the lead role, obviously, in a separate film. It's well documented that the script was written, and while it can be cited that it didn't happen for a multitude of reasons, given the backlash to Dine of the Day, I do wonder if audiences would have ever been even remotely interested in seeing the exploits of this character at any time. Anyway, she has some cool action moments throughout the film, and it's certainly not the first or last time that Bond teams up with a counterpart female agent to do battle, but it's perhaps the most intrusive example of that. Again, I think Berry does okay with what she's given, and in less experienced hands, this character might have been even more heinous. But Jinx is certainly not a character that I expect makes it to the higher echelons of uh, many a Bond girl ranking list. And on a similar note, I can't imagine that Stacey Sutton from A View to a Kill is much of a general fan favourite either. The character gets points from me for being so unintentionally hilarious to this day. I can't help but chuckle when I see the look of shock on her face at being sneaked upon by a blimp, of all things. A giant, noisy dirigible is literally over her shoulder and she manages to be taken by surprise. If I were Bond at that stage, I think I would have just given up. Like, she deserves to be kidnapped for this. Anyway, besides, I always find that there's a distinct lack of chemistry or spark between she and Bond, and as a result, their romantic scenes together tend to fall quite flat. I think a part of this is coming from Roger Moore's own self-confessed apprehensions about being the womanizing lead with someone young enough to be his own daughter. And of course, there's the shrieking. James, don't leave me! James! <laughs> Help me! James! James! The only thing which edges her above the previous few characters on this list for me is that I do think that she's hilarious, and perhaps that's unintentional, but there's a degree of camp to this character and her performance that I do find somewhat appealing, and just how she tends to mess things up for Bond. I mean, she does make me laugh, so she gets points for that at least. And I, I know what you might be thinking. Didn't I mark Kara Malovi down for such haplessness? And yes, I did. The difference for me is how the Bond girl performance gels with the tone and style of the film. Kara, I find invasive, because I think that she breaks the tone in places. Stacy, I feel more enhances the sillier, more irreverent tone of her particular movie. <laughs> 
And here's another one that I feel like I'm going to get some angry comments about. And you know what? Maybe this is just down to the fact that I'm not that big a fan of Thunderball the film anyway. But Domino Duval is a bit like Kissy for me. I'm a little stretched to think of many moments in the film where I'm like, oh yeah, I love her in that bit, that kind of thing. Though I, I do think that she has, for my money at least, two really great standout moments. The first being her performance when Bond tells her that her brother is dead. I think that she's really quite fantastic in that moment. And of course, the moment at the end of the film where she kills Largo. It's a really great cathartic bit for her and quite brave, I think, of the filmmakers to allow a character other than Bond to get in the kill shot, as it were. Like a lot of Bond girls of the 60s, I think that she also suffers slightly from having her voice dubbed. I can only think of rare instances where I think a main character having their voice dubbed by a different actor has added to the performance rather than taken away from it, Goldfinger himself being one of those rare instances, and I wish that we'd just been able to have this performance with Claudine Auger's actual voice, but hey. Well, we can't win them all. This is it. This is it. Okay, here we go. Probably the most frustrating Bond woman of the series. A huge part of my issues with this character come from her being positioned as a great love of Bond's life. This is something that the series has done a couple of times before, and when it works well, like in the cases of Vesper and Tracy, it can create truly magical characters and scenes. Spectre drops the ball on the love story completely, and it's just weird seeing these characters go from, like, your dad's dead to I love you in a matter of days, despite barely having any time time to really get to know each other. No Time to Die went a good way to redeeming this character for me, and I do think that the actress Leia Sadu is actually pretty fantastic, like I've seen her in other stuff, I think she's really great, and that second film gives her a much greater opportunity to display her range, I just feel like there's a lack of spark between her and Craig's Bond, and also just a coldness to her character that makes her kind of hard to like, really, like, I, I, I guess even taking Spectre out of the equation, she wouldn't be much higher on this list, if I were only taking No Time to Die into account, she'd maybe be a couple of places higher at least, but if we were just taking into account Spectre, and this is one of the reasons why I waited until after No Time to Die was released to do this video, because if I was just looking at this character in Spectre, she'd be right at the very bottom of this list. I really don't like her very much in that film, but it's a shame, and uh, probably the Bond girl character that I'm most disappointed isn't higher on this list, given her status as, well, yeah, one of Bond's great loves now, or intended great loves anyway. So when I say that I find her the most frustrating of the characters that I'm talking about on this list, it's because I want her to be brilliant. Like, it's, it, she should be fantastic. She should be in the same league as Tracy and Vesper, but eh, she's just not there. So this was by far the hardest character uh, on this list for me to rank, given her unique status as the main Bond girl of two different Bond adventures. And to be perfectly honest, prior to No no Time to Die's release, if I was only taking into account Spectre, she would have been at the very, very bottom of this list. I'm sorry I'm late, James. But your signal from a car only just reached the office. And on the very opposite end of the great love spectrum, Mary Goodnight, a woman who Bond saw fit to throw in a cupboard while he had sex with someone else in the same room. I think that his character works, and I think that Britt Eklund actually excels with the comedy. I think that she's kind of hilarious, and Man with the Golden Gun is one of those Bond films, like Diamonds Are Forever, that I think works a lot better when you go into it thinking of it more as a comedy rather than a spy action thriller. She's very much a klutz, and at certain points does not other than blunder through situations, escalating the problems that Bond has to take care of, and I think when people think of that stereotypical Bond girl character that I mentioned at the top of this video, they're thinking of her. <laughs> like, gorgeous but dim blonde character, kind of sauntering through things in a bikini. Uh, most Bond girls do not fall into that category of stereotype. Most of them have much more going on, but good night. I have a hard time defending her as anything more than that. Though I do think that she is incredibly fun to watch. Britt Eklund is clearly having an absolute blast playing this character, and whether intended or not, and I think in this case it very much is intended, I do find her a great funny comedic foil for Bond, and it makes her something of a joy in a good few places of the film. I imagine that she probably ends up in the bottom two or three for a lot of people, but I enjoy enough of what she does to place her just a little bit higher. Melina Havelock is a really interesting character in this pantheon, as something of a clear attempt at creating someone much more grounded, sympathetic, and less fantastical than some of her 
counterparts had been at that time. For a good chunk of the running length, she's seeking revenge for the death of her parents, and not since, I think, Tracy, more than a decade earlier, had the series strived for genuine emotional investment in its main female co-star like this. Of course, she fits in very well with the tone of Fiora Eyes Only, and Carol Bouquet is terrific in this role. If anything, I think that the character suffers from a relatively shoehorned romantic relationship with Bond. I, again, this is an instance where I just don't get much chemistry between the pair of them, much like Stacey Sutton. I think that you can sense when Roger's own inadequacies appear when he's asked to be the romantic lead to some of these younger women, and I don't think that her character arc is quite as satisfying as it could have been, the whole thing about not pursuing revenge. I feel like this same type of character is redone and improved upon in a later Craig film, but I think that she has a really striking look and is a great part of her respective film. I thought you were expecting me. Uh, so you're Tatiana Romanova. Same applies to the next character on this list, Tatiana Romanova, played by Daniela Bianchi, and I think that she's generally considered to be a favourite amongst the fandom. Let me know if I'm wrong in the comments below, but I feel like we see a lot of love for this character out there, and a good reason for that is likely because From Russia With Love is one of the most classic and most beloved of all Bond films. Personally speaking, I've never completely gelled with it like many fans do, but I do think that Tatiana is one of the best elements of the film, and I've really grown to love the more ambiguous elements of her role. Like, she's tasked with some double-crossing and duplicity, and the film very much plays with whether or not she is going to be eventually turned over to Bond's side. I wish that these elements were a bit more explored than they are from her perspective, but for what we get with her, I'm very, very happy. I also think that she's one half of probably the single most sexy scene in all of Bond, the bedroom scene, where she and Bond meet for the first time, is so electric. I think these two have a phenomenal chemistry, and the dialogue is so good and she gets to set up this legendary bit of double entendre. You're one of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. Thank you, but I think my mouth is too big. No, it's the right size. For me, that is. But to be on the safe side, I suggest we get an exact measurement. We don't want anyone being disappointed now, do we? Calling Agent Triple X. This is Triple X. Message received and understood. There had certainly been tough Bond girls before her, and heck, there had even been Bond girls who were agents before, but Anya Amasova, played by Barbara Back, was probably the first time the series had ever really overtly tried to make the main female co-star Bond's equal. I mean, she barely gets involved in any of the action and ends the film literally tied to a chair waiting to be saved, but in theory, at least, she was intended to be Bond's equal. Much like how the type of character that Melina Havelock was, I feel, was kind of improved upon later on in the series, I feel like Anya Amasova has that same designation where I, this same kind of archetype is just done better in future installments in the series. But despite that, there is still a lot about this character that I do really love. It helps that The Spy Love Me is one of the very best films of the series, but pairing Bond up with an opposite number, a Soviet opposite number, a Soviet agent, was an absolute masterstroke, and the one-upmanship that plays out between them throughout the film is so lovely. I think that this pair have a really great chemistry together, and as much as I do wish that Anya had a bigger role in some of the action sequences, a way to show us that she truly is Bond's equal and can match him in all aspects, uh, as I say, I feel like they improved on this same type of dynamic later down the line, but I still get an awful lot of enjoyment out out of this character in that film. I think Solitaire is a hugely memorable Bond girl character, and her striking looks, her costumes, her whole voodoo priestess persona is really unforgettable and fun, and gives her something of a unique position in the Bond girl pantheon. I'm a big fan of Live and Let Die, I think Jane Seymour is a really great actress, and particularly considering how young she was here, I think she does a remarkable job holding up against far more experienced performers at this point, like Roger Moore and like Yafet Koto. Perhaps that explains my bias for really liking this character, the love that I have for that film. I'll admit that she's certainly not one of the toughest or smartest or even most helpful of Bond girl characters, and for those reasons I can understand why people might not think very highly of her compared with some of the others, but I don't know, I think that she stands out as a bit of a unique character in the series thanks to her psychic powers, and I like that the film plays a bit with whether or not she genuinely is clairvoyant, or whether it's all just in her head. I have an awful lot of fondness for this character, and well, maybe I just need to half credit the hair and makeup people for this because I can't imagine how much time it took to create some of these looks. If I ever do get to ranking my favourite hair and makeup examples in Bond, and please know that there is no Bondian barrel that I will not scrape, you know Solitaire's coming out on top of that list. Well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. Oh, uh, I might have to take a recount here. 
Get in. What? Get in. Alright. Earlier on when I made a reference to Melina Havlock being a character that was clearly retooled and improved upon later in the series, I was of course referring to Olga Kurilenko's Camille Montez from Quantum of Solace, a film that I'm not exactly a huge fan of, but she is an aspect of it that I do really like, and I think that she proves to be a really great ally for Bond. She has her own personal mission and story that runs throughout the film, which obviously parallels Bond's own journey of revenge, and the two feel like kindred spirits in a lot of ways, and I also just appreciate that they didn't feel the need to shoot horn in an unnecessary romance between this character and Bond. By the end of the film, she's kissing him, and quite passionately at that, but given the relatively somber tone of Quantum of Solace and the fact that both of these people have lost people that they loved, you get the sense that they're not allowing themselves to explore any kind of romance or sexuality because they just don't want to love again at these points in their lives, because that ultimately just led them both to a place of pain in the first place. Olga Kurilenko is a great actress, and I've seen her in a fair few things and liked her in an awful lot. I think that she has a really great screen presence, she's kick-ass when she needs to be, I think she's emotional when she needs to be. I think she's a really solid character and something of a highlight of a Bond film that I personally don't rank terribly highly. And just missing out on a place that the top ten is... Calvin, please, you need to stop this madness immediately! Oh, why Bond fan police? What, what, what are you doing here? Well, I was just proofreading the script of this video and I got to the number 11 choice and... I, I, this is madness, Calvin. At first I thought it was part of a, a, a sketch and then I thought maybe you're just being deliberately provocative, but you seem to be quite sincere about this and I, I don't understand why you're doing this. Who hurt you? Well, it's as I said at the start of this video, you know, this ranking is entirely comprised of my own personal opinions and how much I enjoy these characters and what they do in their respective films and I know that this character gets a bad rap, but Maybe if you just hear me out. Oof, I, I mean, okay, but I warn you, you could lose every ounce of credibility you have for this. I, I have credibility? I thought Christmas only comes once a year. Before you frantically scroll to the comments to tear me a new one for this, let me state my case. While this list is entirely based on how I, me personally, enjoy these characters, and when compiling this, I kind of, like, judged all of these characters against each other based on how much I like seeing them on screen in their respective films, and yeah, I do really enjoy seeing Denise Richards as Dr. Christmas Jones. I, I just, I love this character. I'm a kid of the 90s, okay? I was becoming a Bond fan to towards the end of that decade, and of course that's when The World's Not Enough was released, and to this day, it is still a favourite of the series for me, and one of, probably, <laughs> the most notorious aspects of that film was Denise Richards casting as Christmas Jones. Criticism about her in the role tend to focus on her being an unconvincing choice for a nuclear physicist, and I'm certainly someone who has said such things about her in the past, but I think, as I have with a lot of things Bond-related, been on something of a journey, and kind of ended up reverting back to where I was with her as a kid, which is just sheer, pure enjoyment. There are things in Bond, like like Sheriff Pepper, I kind of equate to uh, him to her in weird ways, like neither character is really what you'd want in a serious Bond adventure, but I'll be damned if I just don't have an awful lot of fun watching them. Admittedly, Christmas is not a terribly fleshed out character, and the attempts at cashing in on Tomb Raider are there, and I mean, her costume alone is quite clearly a reference to that video game character that was really popular around this time. Richard's casting was very much an executive decision, and I mean, you know, I, I've read her memoirs, and she talks about her experience filming this film in these, and I kind of feel bad for her coming out of reading these. She was kind of a bit sad on the set, really, and she didn't feel like she was overall wanted, and she was just kind of there doing the best that she could at that time, and yeah, if you hire Denise Richards to do a job like this, then yeah, what are you, what are you expecting? Fact is, I just really enjoy seeing her in this film, and I think that she fits in quite well, though admittedly, from more of a B-movie camp kind of a way, I can very much appreciate that she might not be everyone's cup of tea, and she obviously ain't winning Oscar for her work, but given that this is a series where the auditioning process for Bond girls would be asking, were you in Miss World and do you speak English? <laughs> like, based on that, I don't think that she quite deserves all of the pearl-clutching, aghast reactions that she continues to get. So there you go, I can't really articulate it beyond just, like, I just have a fun time watching this character on screen. She brings a smile to my face every time I watch The World Is Not Enough, and I wouldn't want her replaced at all. Like, I, I'm really okay with her in this film. I like her an awful lot, and genuinely, that comes from the heart. I'm speaking from the heart, and that's all I can do, right? Ugh, Jesus Christ. 
Hello! Due to circumstances beyond my control, I will be hosting the rest of this video from the Bond fan Gulag. Thank you for your understanding. <laughs> Halle Berry fan. Into the top 10 now, with Tiffany Case from Diamonds Are Forever. I think that Jill St. John is a whole lot of fun in this part and a real highlight of the film. You tend to find that named Bond girls who are American don't tend to rate terribly highly on Bond girl lists, and I do wonder why that is. Perhaps it's just not quite as exotic-seeming as when they find, like, European actresses to be in these parts. But anyway, Diamonds is largely set in America and in Las Vegas in particular, and she fits right in. She's brash, she's loud, she's classy, but in a different way. Like, she feels more kind of world-weary than I think a lot of Bond girls do. She might not be incredibly intelligent, but she has a lot of street smarts and savviness that she needs to stay alive and on top in her line of work. Keep leading on that tutor, Charlie, and you're gonna get a shot in the mouth! I also just think that she's very funny. I think the actress is a really good comedian. Uh, Diamonds is a film that works far better as a comedy than it does a serious spy thriller, and she fits right in. She can deliver a quip to rival Sean Connery and Charles Gray, which is exactly what you want in that film. I think that she brings a great energy and wit to the part. Um, she's always been a favourite character of mine in this series, and quite possibly because Diamonds Are Forever was the second Bond film I ever saw. It's mostly dull routine, of course, but every now and then, you get to sail on a beautiful evening like this, and sometimes work with a decadent agent of a corrupt Western power. I haven't mentioned this term so far, but the Bond girl curse is something that I don't think it has much resonance today, but certainly in the past there was a perception that if actresses were to take on the Bond girl part in whatever Bond film was being made, that their future career opportunities could potentially be diminished. This curse, however, whether you believe in it or not, can almost certainly not be applied to Michelle Yeoh. Yes, the actress who played Waylon in the 1997 film Tomorrow Never Dies, I feel like I see her everywhere these days, and I can't be the only one because they even made a film with a title describing her prominence in mass media. She's in action films, dramas, romantic comedies, and I'm thrilled about this because I really like this actress. I think that she's incredibly versatile, and she co-stars in one of my all-time favourite Bond films, Tomorrow Never Dies. She's another character in the kick-ass counterpart agent sidekick role, and it really does feel tailor-made to her strengths, showcasing the actress's own physical prowess, and she makes a great ally for Bond. I do think that the character suffers from that same thing that Melina Havelock did, where I feel like the romantic aspect of the relationship feels a bit shoehorned in, particularly right at the end where the pair resolve to just like have stealth boat wreck sex rather than be rescued, but whatever. I love the back and forth between these two when they're on the bike. I think that they storm the villain's base at the end together really well, and I have so much love for Michelle Yeoh as an actress. I just always enjoy seeing her on screen. What's your name? Ryder. Ryder what? Honey Ryder. Iconic is probably the first word that comes to mind, and if it doesn't, it probably damn well should when thinking about Ursula Andress as Honey Rider, the first main Bond girl of the series, who was of course introduced to the world in that incredible bikini sauntering out of the water, and Jaws the globe over dropped to the floor, and by that I of course mean people's individual Jaws because of how gorgeous she is, not like Jaws Jaws dropped to the floor, though I'm sure that Richard Kill was probably bowled over by her too. Much like the film's titular villain character, she is actually introduced into the story rather late in proceedings, but once she is, she's along with Bond for the rest of the adventure. I've always really loved this kind of otherworldly quality that she brings with her, in part, I'm sure, fueled by the fact that Ursula Andress is just one of the most, like, out-of-this-world beautiful people to have ever existed. Look at her, for God's sake. I love that she was cast as the Greek goddess of love in Clash of the Titans, because that's just perfect casting. She looks like she was created by some kind of deity. How is this woman a human being. Ryder has this mythical air about her in Doctor No. She's not conventionally educated, but similar to Tiffany Case, she has this world weariness about her. She has lived, and she feels like she's had real world experiences which have hardened her, but she also feels like she's somehow separate from society, from everything else that we've seen in the film to that point, and that works great. It's easy to see how she is still thought of as one of the most iconic Bond girls of them all, and I don't expect that quality will ever diminish. <laughs> 
to Kill is really a film that has grown on me over the years, and I've talked about this in other videos as a kid, it was probably the Bond film that I'd have ranked at the very bottom, but in recent years it's grown and grown and grown in my rankings, and right now I think it'd probably sit just outside of the top ten if I were to rank all of the Bond films. Um, I think that I was sleeping on a couple of the very best Bond villain and Bond girls in the series, with Fran Sanchez and Pam Bouvier. Carrie Lowell plays the pilot come CIA informant in the 1989 film, and I think that she does really well to bring a bit of uh, I guess warmth and lightness to the film. She's not broadly comedic like Mary Goodnight, nor is she invasively comedic like Cara Malovi, but some of her lines, her chemistry with Dalton and Llewellyn, some of the duplicity that she gets to play with, I think that she's a really fun presence in a film that is generally quite serious and gritty, but she's fun in a way that complements and provides relief rather than feeling tonally jarring. I also enjoy the will they won't they aspect, like the which woman is Bond going to end up with that runs throughout the film with her and Talisa Soto's Lupe character. It gives Pam something of a journey to go on throughout the film. She starts out quite hardened and presumably as happy to use Bond for just, like, just plain old sex as he is with her. Maybe they share that same damn water fetish they are doing on a boat after all. But by the end of the film, she has, of course, been wooed by Bond's heroism and their romance is so magical that it can apparently cause inanimate objects to come to life. Whoa! I think Bouvier is a great all-rounder. She's funny when she needs to be, tough and a great ally when she needs to be, and incredibly sexy when she needs to be. My favourite Bond girl of the Dalton era by some way. Can I help you? Yes, my name is Bond. James Bond. I am looking for Dr. Goodhead. You just found her. A woman. Your powers of observation do you credit, Mr. Bond. Another kick-ass Bond counterpart agent ekes in just outside the top five now, Dr. Holly Goodhead, and I don't know about you, but because I became a Bond fan when I was around about nine or ten years old, like, the double entendre element of that name only really became apparent to me well into my teens, and I will forever remember that moment as the day the innocence of my childhood really did leave me once and for all. I am looking for Dr. Goodhead. You just found her. Dr. Goodhead? What an odd name. Dr. Goodhead. Goodhead. Good... Head. Goodhead. Good... Head? But yes, Dr. Goodhead, played by Lois Childs, notable for not only not making good on her name during the course of the film, but also being a, I think, somewhat underrated Bond girl, perhaps due to the fact that she's co-starring in one of the more derided Bond films, Moonraker. As I alluded to earlier on with Anya Massiver, I feel like Goodhead is that same character done better. Even if the reasons for the sparring between her and Bond isn't quite as strong, Moonraker tries to go for a bit of a battle of the sexes kind of thing as a source of conflict between the pair which I don't think works quite as well as the whole East versus West angle of The Spy Who Loved Me. However, I do think that Goodhead works much better as a counterpart agent. She's doing a lot of her own investigating, she has her own cool gadgets, she actually gets involved in the action, and even takes the lead at a couple of points, all while displaying, I think, really great chemistry with Roger's Bond. I love the back and forth banter between the two of these people throughout the film. She's an awful lot of fun, and a big reason why I <laughs> genuinely, unironically, love Moon Raker so much. I wondered when you might arrive. And it's another Roger Moore Bond woman who takes the number five spot on this list. Maud Adams' as Octopussy, another Bond girl name where any potential double meaning was lost on me until I was embarrassingly close to adulthood. What an odd name. Octopussy. 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 <laughs> like eight furry little... Oh. Of all the more era romantic co-stars, she's the one that I could totally imagine his bond settling down with. There's something about this pair together, their wonderful chemistry. I mentioned this in a couple of my previous Bond film reviews, but I do think in a way that it's kind of a shame that Roger's Bond didn't end his tenure with Octopussy, because I could just totally imagine these two trying to make a real go of it. She makes sense as a partner to Bond. She also holds perhaps the most interesting job title of all Bond girls as a smuggler slash circus entrepreneur. I love how the film plays with her moral ambiguity in places. She's very almost set up to be the main big bad villain of the thing, and I think that Adams does really well portraying the, uh, the gravitas and authority of a leader in this part, and yet she also has a vulnerability and a warmth that I think is conveyed really nicely and never feels contradictory. Adams herself, of course, holds a special 
official designation in the Bond girl pantheon as an actress who returned to the series as a different character. Of course, she played a secondary Bond girl, Andrea Anders, in The Man with the Golden Gun previously. Octopussy is a completely different character, and of the rumoured names who were in the casting pool for this part, like Faye Dunaway, I'm really happy that things worked out so that Maud Adams was cast instead. I think that she brings a very unique energy to this part, and I think the familiarity with Roger Moore certainly helps. The character has enough going on that she could warrant her own spin-off adventures, but it's some wonderful chemistry here with her and Bond. She's always been a firm favourite of mine. My name is Pussy Galore. I must be dreaming. Goodhead Octopussy and now Pussy Galore. Can you tell I have a thing for Bond girls with the most provocative names? Yes, easily one of the most iconic characters in all of Bond, brought to life superbly by Honor Blackman. Pussy Galore is a delight, and I think the final nail in the coffin for me regarding the innocence of my youth. Right, time to put together my presentation on all the great things about the James Bond films, starting with the Bond girls. Right, let's find some nice pictures of these characters, starting with... Much like Tatiana before her, Pussy straddles that line between good and bad for much of her film, but she's always fun. What Blackman does with this character really works with Goldfinger's more irreverent tone. She has that same, like, candidness that I think Sean Connery has as James Bond, where it's not quite tongue-in-cheek, but there's a self-awareness to the performance that is just really magnetic, and I think it contrasts with some of the other Bond girls of the era who perhaps played their parts a little bit more earnestly. Despite possessing one of the more silly and outrageous Bond girl names, Pussy Galore is probably one of the smartest, toughest, and most savvy of the bunch. Most of all, though, I just relish the character. She's a standout in the series and completes Goldfinger's quadfecta of sensational Bond, sensational villain, sensational main henchman, and sensational main Bond girl. But don't stand there, get us out of here. Yes, sir. Okay, we're into the top three now, and I have to confess, this is such a tight margin, I absolutely adore all three of these characters for slightly different reasonings, and Natalia Simonova in particular, because out of all of these characters, she really does feel to me like she could be a real person. Don't get me wrong, I get that part of the appeal of a lot of Bond girls is that they can be larger than life in many ways, and I enjoy those aspects of certain characters very much, but Natalia has such a special, unique role out of all of these characters, and in so many ways, I think she feels like the most grounded and realistic. There are elements that I feel she shares with Kara from The Living Daylights in a sense, in that she's a relatively normal person suddenly whisked away into a fantastic world and adventure, but she's so proactive in her story as Natalia, and she is having to drive her own narrative through a good chunk of the film. We are introduced to her long before Bond is in the film, and we follow her following up on clues, and she's just generally being very active in finding out what happened to her co-workers and friends. She experiences this horrific event, and she wants to get to the bottom of it. Isabella Skorupko is great in this part. I know that the actress herself made a decision to not pursue some of the career opportunities that she might have had off of the back of Goldeneye, and while I obviously respect her hugely for that decision, I'd have loved to have seen her in more stuff. She does have a career, of course, mind, and I genuinely seek out films just on the basis of this actress being in it. There is something about her that I find incredibly appealing and likeable. Natalia is a brilliant computer programmer and quite sassy throughout the film. I love her barking orders at Bond and confronting him at a point in the film, challenging his status, his attitude, which prompts some really nice dialogue between the pair. I love her is this ultimate survivor of the Bond girls, and she's really put through the ringer. This bit is always something that really gets me when her workplace is exploding around her and she's looking up at just absolute hell here, and the fact that she comes out of this story smiling, triumphant, joking with Bond is so satisfying. I absolutely love this character and the journey that we follow her on through the film. Your Royal Highnesses, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, the toast is the bride and bridegroom, Mr. and Mrs. James Bond.
Of course, Mrs. James Bond had to come out high on this list, and how could she not? Diana Rigg is iconic in this part, and precisely one half of one of the greatest love stories in all of Bond. On Her Majesty's Secret Service certainly provided something of an overt influence on the later stages of the Craig era of Bond, and I genuinely can't blame them for trying to capture some of that same love and sentiment of one of the most profound relationships of the series. Diana Rigg was, at the time, and continued to be one of the more famous and widely recognised faces outside of the series. She had a hugely prolific career, and if anything, particularly at that time in the series history, they were really lucky to have an actress of this calibre in that role. For all of my criticisms about George Lazenby being a bit wooden in the title role, it was his first feature film after all, and he had such little acting experience. I think Rig works really well to bring out some of his best work in the film. There are some really heartfelt moments, the whole barn scene where he proposes to her is so wonderfully written, and Yes, on my latest rewatch, I think that it's actually really well acted by both of these performers. Tracy is a complex and incredibly well-rounded character. Her self-destructive nature is a focus of early parts of the film and how Bond is able to give her a reason to live. She's smart and being the daughter of a huge crime syndicate boss has certainly given her a, uh, a world-weary savviness, meaning that she's more than happy to leap into action to help Bond out in places, taking the wheel during a pivotal escape moment. I can't imagine Tracy coming out particularly low on any Bond fans, Bond girl ranking. I mean, I know people who don't even like the film on Her Majesty's Secret Service very much, but there is sort of like a universal agreement that she is one of the best things to happen to the series ever. Many will cite her as one of the very best characters in the entire Bond pantheon, and I think that's a testament to a, a great, well, <laughs> marriage, if you'll forgive the pun, of phenomenal actress and really high quality writing. And both of those designations can also be applied to the number one character on this list and the best Bond girl ever for my money. Every penny of it. Another of Bond's great loves here, Vesper Lind, an example of some of the best romantic chemistry in the entire series for me. This word has come up a lot throughout this video, chemistry, and I know and I really can't oversell enough just how important it can be, like just that spark, that romantic frisson between the Bond actor and the Bond girl. Sometimes you can have perfectly great actors paired together, but if there isn't that magic between them, it's just not the same, and I don't want this to be a, let's tear down one thing to make another thing look better, but I can't help but compare the bookend romances to Craig's era and just how wildly different they feel, despite arguably similar great dialogue and actors. Anyway, Eva Green is just perfect in this part. In real life, the actress is best known for quirkier roles outside of Bond, I'd say. I know she does a lot with director Tim Burton, and I I think that in a weird way she can't help but bring some of that eccentric outsider personality to Vespa, making her feel somewhat unique. Similar to Natalia, I think that she feels quite real. She has a lot of strength, but not in a in that typical like kick-ass female agent counterpart kind of way. And she's very smart, but not in a look at me, I'm a nuclear geological space shuttle scientist physicist kind of way. But the chemistry, my god, the chemistry between these two is electric. They feel like a real celebrity pretty couple almost. When they're involved in action scenes together, I'm so invested because I don't want to see anything bad happen to either of them, and when they're sniping banter back and forth, I'm smiling, and when they have more tender emotional moments, I'm just so completely invested. And obviously, much like Tracy before her, this is one of only a handful of Bond, Bond girl relationships that needed to work in order for the film to work at all. A lot of the characters on this list, while I may like them an awful lot or not like them all that much, few have had the entire crux of the film weighing on them in the same way that Tracy and Vesper did, and I think that both On Her Majesty's Secret Service and Casino Royale did a phenomenal job at capturing lightning in a bottle twice. Vesper slightly ekes ahead for me personally out of the two of them, but it couldn't be a closer photo finish. If the series is ever able to replicate the, just the quality of these romances, these chemistries, these memorable characters again, then I will be one very happy Bond fan. Let me know your own personal thoughts and rankings in the comments section below. I hear that if Christmas Jones makes it into enough Bond fans top 17, I can be eligible for parole. <laughs> 
And while you're down there, why not hit the subscribe button if you're not already subscribed to this channel, and you can also hit the Mrs. Bell notification button to stay super up to date on future video okay, uploads Lincoln. that I will make on this channel, and uh, there's also the like button. If you've liked this video, then uh, do click that. Also below are links to my various social media pages, including my Facebook page, my Twitter page, my Instagram page, and my Patreon page, for those of you who want to go one extra step in supporting this channel, so please do uh, follow those links below for more details. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans. Oh. So long for now.